Hey everybody and welcome back to the Off the Key Podcast. I'm your host Mac and today I'm joined by my two regular co-hosts, Garrett. Bleep. And James. Blop. And today we've got a little bit of a different video for you guys. We're introducing one of the new series on Off the Key and that is a guide to blank. So basically, we're going to go over the history of a genre that we think is worth your attention. We're going to get some records together that we think are historically important and also records that we think would be a nice way to introduce you to it. So today, for the very first episode of A Guide To, we're going to be doing A Guide To Synth Pop. The starter packs, if you will. Yes, a starter pack. You know, totally original idea. Haven't heard that one before. I think synth pop is one of the most enduring and long-lasting pop subgenres to exist the origins of the genre date back to the 70s so and even you could argue even earlier so no doubt yeah synth pop and the history of electronic music are so interwoven i think it's very important that we talk about this genre and it honestly it has some of my favorite albums of all time in it it's overall quality is very high i think synth pop is important to the development of modern electronic music as well i mean the sounds of you know, what Kraftwerk and YMO, those guys were doing back in the 70s, has influenced artists even up into today. In the 2020s so far, we've had a pretty significant resurgence of synth pop as a genre. I mean, we have freaking Haley Williams doing her spin on the genre, The Weeknd, Charlie XCX, Dua Lipa, you know, all these huge, huge pop acts are going back to the sound of the 80s, the sound of synth pop, the sound of dance pop, and even a little bit of new wave and post-punk. The synthesizer, which is the central instrument to this genre. I would say it is one of the central instruments in pop in general anyway. Honestly, one of the most important instruments to modern music. Yeah, I would put it right up there alongside the guitar. I would say that synth pop is really one of the big genres in modern music. But yes, um, if you're wondering what is synth pop, definitively what is the genre? Synth pop is a subgenre of new wave music that first gained prominence in the late 1970s through acts like progressive rock, electronic music, art rock. You know, you had guys like Bowie and even Rush introducing elements of electronic music, synthesizers, and especially disco. Yeah, and you could go back further too. I mean, Pink Floyd was using synths in the early 70s. So, in these examples, the the synthesizer is a more prominent right instrument. It's the more dominant instrument, but especially the Krautrock bands of the 70s and 60s, like Kraftwerk. Krautrock had an essential role to play in the development of electronic music. Kraftwerk, I would call them the progenitors of the modern synth-pop movement. Now, what I call all of their music synth-pop, no, but there is a very clear pointer to Kraftwerk as one of the central bands in the development of synth-pop and the synthesizer in modern popular music. The early 70s, Kraut rock, progressive rock usage of synths, and then like your soundtracks, you know, your John Carpenter, you know, on you know, soundtracks to movies and TV, that was like the embryo, so to speak. And then yeah. craft work is like the forming of the organism. That's when you actually have the shape of modern synth pop. Craft work is the the grandfathers, so to speak. To speak about the embryo stage, I suppose, soundtracks is a very good point because probably one of the most prominent examples of electronic music being used for the first time in a popular setting, like in a a pretty relatively popular movie, A Clockwork Orange. That soundtrack composed by Wendy Carlos, who is a foundational composer in electronic music in general, and a, a big part of why electronic music would become so prominent. That soundtrack was really the first time that a lot of people actually heard electronic music. So it was a major, major influence. And not to mention her earlier album from 1968 of her doing uh, Bach compositions with a synthesizer with electronic music. Yeah, shout out to Winnie Carlos, one of the OGs of electronic music. You know, Kraftwerk, German band, very iconic in terms of the kraut rock and electronic music that they would produce back in the day but also i would say second to them is a very very special band to me yellow magic orchestra very iconic trio one of the most popular groups in japan for a very very long time you had Kraftwerk, and then right in front of them was yellow magic orchestra and those two groups were the groups that really pushed electronic music into the mainstream into the charts really 
YMO, they had a debut, their, you know, their self-titled debut before then, and that actually charted in America. But I think Solid State Survivor was one of the like revolutionary moments. Very iconic album. I mean, you had three of the biggest legends, huge industry veterans at the time. I mean, Ryuichi Sakamoto, you had Harumi Hosono, and you also had uh, Yukihiro Takahashi. These guys were all industry legends, and they saw the viability of the TR-808 synthesizer. And they became icons in Japan, really. Yeah, the two artists, I would say, that entered the actual pop charts with the style that we would consider synth pop today, the later part of the 70s, would be Yellow Magic Orchestra and Gary Newman when he started to separate from his punk roots with with Tube Boy Army. That's when synth pop started to really move into the charts and went from being this semi-obscure yeah. genre kind of I mean, weird it, underground it started to coalesce into its own genre yep and exploded onto the mainstream in the beginning of the 80s yes yeah, so, and that was this was during the development of new wave mm -hmm. uh you know post-punk all these genres that would go on to incorporate synthesizers in their music very prominently you know we kind of had this explosion of dance music come out in the 80s and i do think the synthesizer has a significant role to play in that I would, I would say it is the significant yeah. part of the sound of the 80s. And when you think of the 80s, what, what do you think of first? The synthesizer. Yeah. It's the synth pop sound. That is the sound that pretty much everyone I know thinks of. The synth sound and the echoey new wave guitar. As, those are both of those. Those are the sounds of the 80s. You had these huge British synth pop acts like Pet Shop Boys. You had European acts like Aha, you know, Tears for Fears. They all pretty much rode this wave and became huge in America thanks to the sound of synth pop. You know, MTV, a MTV pretty much was the vehicle for British synth pop acts to get popular in the U.S. It was Europe. It was Japan, especially Europe. I mean, you had groups like Depeche Mode. You had Gary Newman. You had Tears for Fears. Well, I would argue is more new wave, but I definitely think they had a significant impact on the synth pop movement. They used a lot of synthesizers, but you know, Aha, Devo, yeah, Devo, and even Duran Duran a little bit. Yep. Eurythmics with Annie Lennox. I mean, you name it. Alphaville. I, yeah, I cannot think of like a single like American synth pop act off the top of my head. Even when you go to some of the albums that we include here, like Currents from Tame Paul, you know, Kim Parker's from Australia. A lot of these significant synth pop acts came from Europe. One of the most notable characteristics of synth pop especially in the 80s was this overwhelming sense of melodrama when it wasn't super danceable like you know the ymo strand of it it was very melodramatic you know very intentionally artificial that's the defining sound of it not only just from the the synths and stuff but just the general theme of the music in the 70s especially with the craft work stuff it was definitely much more of a darker more of a robotic robotic yeah. sound where in the 80s it kind of got more emotion and more more of the poppiness synth pop really put its mark on popular music in the 80s and even in the, ni the 90s i mean you got to look at guys like depeche mode you know these these guys have been around forever but they created their iconic masterpiece in the form of violator personally i believe is a masterpiece. is a 10 i would uh, agree. 10 out of 10 yep. but also it represented the darker side of synth pop you know it, it represented the more gothic still melodramatic but very dark side of synth pop there were a lot of different subsections of synth pop yeah i believe the height of the intensity of that melodrama would be a band like spandau ballet or like orchestral maneuvers in the dark that are almost kind of over the top and a little cheesy with with how they approach it that would be like the extremes and on top of that, I feel like synth pop paved the way for so many popular electronic music genres like house, like synth wave. Electronic music today has a lot to owe to synth pop. Absolutely. I mean, I believe Daft Punk would have never really came to as much prominence as they did were it not for synth pop and their synth pop influences. Yeah. One of their biggest is uh, Georgia Moroder, one of the one of the oh freaking geez oh my yes. gosh prominent contributions into both disco electronic and synth pop i do want to highlight some of the key characteristics of synth pop as a genre so you kind of understand 
where we're coming from, what we mean when we say synth pop. So synth pop was defined by its primary use of synthesizers, drum machines, and sequencers, sometimes using them to replace all other instruments. And that's where that intentional artificiality comes in, that kind of robotic nature that you get, it, especially in a lot of early synth pop, you know, albums like Kraftwerk's The Man Machine, YMO's Self-Titled and Solid State Survivor. The genre is diverse and characterized by a broad set of values that overturned a lot of the rock playing styles, I think. You know, they kind of threw them on their head and it replaced them with synthetic rhythms and textures. And there was a lot of pushback for the genre initially and just electronic music in general because of its artificiality, the robotic nature, you know, like people that weren't talented musicians were able to create catchy and enjoyable music. And that's probably one of the biggest criticisms of synth pop as a genre is a lot of the people who uh, populate that genre are not very talented, musically speaking. And yet they still wrote some great songs. Another reason that I find this movement so significant is it gave opportunity to artists that otherwise would not be able to create music the opportunity to make something awesome, to make something cool and exciting and cutting edge. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was one of the best driving forces in the, the democratization of music. And I think that is actually very, very important to the development of music in general. I would say that the detractors were wrong, just straight up wrong. It also cuts down on the moving parts. A lot of these bands, they had their long-lasting appeal because they didn't really break up. You know, sometimes it was just a single person or just two people. A lot of the musicians in synth pop, they didn't go through years and years of training for like a guitar or a, like a regular acoustic instrument. They learned much quicker using, you know, just electronic instruments and, and MIDI production and everything. So sure, that did help them out a lot in terms of the learning curve. But at the end of the day, you still have to compose music. You still have to compose the melodies. The machines, the synthesizers, the electronic music instruments, they don't just make it up themselves. You have to program them. So you're still writing music. It's a lot easier for you. And I do understand that there's controversy with that, which I, you know, I disagree. You know, I've always viewed digital audio software or things like that as just another tool, another instrument to create whatever you're trying to create. I actually think the the themes, a lot of the lyrical themes and sounds that synth pop would explore actually complement the genre. It's like synth pop, you know, you've got a lot of feelings of emotional coldness, disconnectedness, isolation, a lot of like darker, depressing themes that come out of many strands of synth pop, especially with acts like Depeche Mode. I think that it does complement the style. On top of that, synth pop has such a massive level of versatility. It draws a lot of parallels with rock, rock and roll. Like rock, when it came out, received similar criticisms from a lot of the classical and the bebop and the jazz musicians and critics and stuff. The critics, for sure, saw it as like basically a dumbed down music where, yeah, they were still using live instruments, but they were using much simpler melodic patterns and chord structures, but they still created some of the greatest songs of all time. And that's, to your point, rock also has that versatility. So that's why they're so important. And how can you really get mad at quality of life changes? That's really essentially what it is with the, all this new technology. It's essentially just quality of life changes. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's that's just kind of the whole, like, oh, I had to go through it, so why do they get to skip that part? You know? <laughs> Dumb. Asinine. You know, historically speaking, the, the genre has just endured and, and developed and grown into different branches and subsections. And it's all a revival in the 2000s with acts like LaRue, even in some strands of the Indietronica movement with groups like the Postal Service. You know, this genre has endured and evolved so massively and for so long that it's, it's, it's I mean, even in the 2010s, one of the biggest albums of the 2010s, Tame Paula's Currents, that's a synth pop album. That is a dance pop synth pop album. And it was one of the biggest records of that decade. You know, the genre is alive and well, and it's thriving. And even so far as the 2020s, we had Dua Lipa with Future Nostalgia. We had The Weeknd with not only After Hours, but Dawn FM as well. I mean, he is going in a full synth pop direction right now. And that Dawn FM was one of the biggest albums of 2022. You know, this, this genre is alive and well, and I think it's very relevant. And that's why I wanted to highlight it today. It's enduring. It is 
you know, a blanket. It's kind of like rock where it can absorb a lot of different styles and work very well. It can be, it's very diverse in its lyrical content. It can be bright and dancey. It can be dark and cold and, you know, calculating and removed. It can be bright and dance pop oriented. It can be dark and borderline dark wave. It can take all these different elements and seamlessly blend them. And that's what gives it its enduring quality. Yeah, it's such a, like rock, like you were saying, James, it's such a malleable genre that you can take it in so many different directions. And that's why I think it's really significant. Now, to get to the point of this video, I wanted to, you know, the boys and I, we wanted to gather up some records that we thought would help you step into the world of synth pop. Not all of these records are outright masterpieces or anything like that, but I think these are all great approachable records that not only show you the history of the genre in a snapshot, but help you wet your toe, dip your toes into it, so to speak. These are um, all bangers. Not only that, but some of them are not purely synth pop albums, and this is just another way for us to demonstrate the malleability of synth pop. And I want to start with the 70s. We've already kind of mentioned it a little bit. The first album I wanted to highlight was Kraftwerk's The Man Machine. Now, I wouldn't necessarily call this album synth pop, but I think it has the fabric of the genre. Kind of like with Slint, Spiderland, and Post Rock and Math Rock, you know, I think Kraftwerk's The Man Machine, that album has all the defining characteristics of synth pop and what synth pop would develop into. Yeah, this is actually the first album to be actually called a pop album or it wasn't called synth pop. It was, it was it like was techno called, pop. It was the synth pop before synth pop became a term. I'm including this record more as a historical piece. I think it's a great album, actually. Yes. I think it's fantastic, mm -hmm. but it, you could argue it's a little dated and not very original, but you got to think, you know, when this album came out, this was revolutionary. This was like unheard of at the time. The only thing that it lacks from typical synth pop is that it doesn't really have the bouncy, catchy, vocal melodies of mm -hmm. that the genre would later be defined by. It has a very talking, robotic style, and the hooks are essentially carried by the instrumentals. Yeah, and, and thematically, it's much more about isolation. You know, and, robotic. Yeah, technology. It's, it's theme, you know, technology. Future. But yes, I would definitely recommend checking that out if you want to kind of get a, a snapshot of where synth pop came from. Next on the list, we've already talked about them, but YMO. Honestly, I could put their self-titled record here, but I think Solid State Survivor is better. better. Mm -hmm. It's more concise, and it's when I think of synth pop, this is one of the first records that I think of. I think this is a quintessential synth pop album. If you want to understand the genre, if you want to know where it came from, listen to Solid State Survivor by Yellow Magic Orchestra. It's danceable, it's bright, super fun. The mm -hmm. bass is great. Very iconic. I think Ry Ryuichi Sakamoto kills it on this album on the synthesizers. And it's almost entirely made with electronic instruments. It's really got almost this video game sound. And that's not to say that, that's not to diminish it. Actually, in my opinion, it, it highlights the the bounciness, the almost whimsical quality of a lot of the I would not be tracks. surprised if a lot of video game composers were inspired by Yellow Magic Orchestra. It feels like if you took an 8-bit track to an old like Atari game and you blew it up and you expanded it, you gave it better production and you grew it out to be a full-sized project with all the modern production and what have you, and you like expanded the channel, expanded the sound, that is what you would get. And it's absolutely worth every second of your time. I think this record is amazing mm. and one of the quintessential synth pop records. I, could, I would hand this record to literally anybody. The next record came out about a year after yeah, Solid State yeah, Survivor. Pretty, pretty uh, close. Gary Newman's The Pleasure Principle. It was the record that exploded synth pop into the mainstream. Yes. YMO had some charting hits from their first album and their second album, but... The Pleasure Principle is the album that exploded the genre. Yeah, specifically with the iconic track, Cars. It's all because Gary Newman found a synthesizer in the studio where his band was practicing and hit an iconic chord that he would later feature on Shadow in Vain on um, his Two Boy Army's debut. And later, he would get away from that post-punk and that punk rock sound 
but it will still be incorporated in a lot of his music, and that's why Pleasure Principle has live drums and has live. It has yep. a lot of live instrumentation to go along with Gary Newman's dark synthesizer, and that's what made it so so popular. Yeah, and this was the first synth pop record to really just hit the mainstream and take it by storm. And honestly, I didn't talk about it too much in our you know history section, but synth pop has a lot to thank from post punk and punk music in general. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is a very significant strand of synth pop that comes from the sound of post-punk. It was actually the, a lot of the punk musicians that were adopting and, and cr- <laughs> punk, punk musicians and punk critics. So, well, some of them, there was, it was a lot of the punk critics that were one of the, some of the loudest voices in the, the tractor camp saying that it was too artificial and you know, all that stuff. But it turned out that it was because of those guys and because of, it was that do-it-yourself attitude that drew them to the synthesizer. Yeah, exactly, which is very ironic. I yes. just, I just <laughs> want to say <laughs> very, very ironic. But yes, and now we want to move on to some of the really massive records that came out, you know, I'd say like mid-'80s. And I would argue this was kind of the golden age of the genre. Yeah, I, I can definitely agree with that. We had AHA with Hunting High and Low, you know, Tears for Fears with songs from The Big Chair, and Pet Shop Boys with Please. You know, these were some of the biggest synth pop acts of the 1980s. Massive, massive hits. I mean, Aha with one of the most, with one of the biggest, biggest, monstrous hits of the 80s and uh, perhaps of all time. uh, Tears for Fears with almost all of their high charting hits on one album. The synth line to take on me is. One of the most, not only most iconic synth pop or synthesizer recordings ever made, but that melody, that line, the hook for that song is one of the most iconic hooks, period, of all time. Yeah, and, I mean, a- ask someone on the street to recite that hook and they'll probably be able to do it. Yeah, just any random. And I would say that these are also some of the best sounding records of the genre. Songs from the Big Chair sound so fucking good the production value on these albums were amazing i was a little hesitant to add songs from the big chair to this list because i don't think that's truly a full synth pop record i think it's more new wave personally Mm -hmm. but everybody wants to rule the world that is a synth pop song and that is one of the most iconic one of the biggest synth pop songs one of the biggest singles of all time Again, that just show, goes to show the malleability of the genre because you can add so much to it. Tears for Fears really drew from a lot of influences for that album, including just rock or Af- even Afrobeat, African music, world music. They used a lot of different elements to craft the wonderful songs and that just wonderful album. It goes to show that even using synthesizers, you can still create some great great music that's layered and complex but not too pretentious yeah exactly and i i think songs for the big chair is a freaking classic i mean every record here is pretty much classic but i probably go back to that album the most of everything here besides maybe like solid state survivor now the pet shop boys record please i think that's probably the most bare bones synth pop record here agreed like if i were to hand somebody that record i'd say the simplest the bare basics, like the mineral truth. Yeah, but there's still some great melodies, great songs on this record. I mean, West End Girls came from Please, and that's another classic 80s hit, classic synth pop song. I mean, it's inescapable. I've heard Opportunity a lot lately in commercials, too. It was in that one, like Mercedes Benz commercial. They brought it back. And that album, Please, really goes to show a lot more of the simplistic like DIY you know just a couple of guys picking up some instruments and then seeing what happens there's a lot of sequencers there's a lot of of like little clips little audio clips put you know here and there it 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 reflects like a new discovery of music that is inherent throughout the genre for the reasons that we just described and I think that's the beauty in it because it's it is so simplistic but the three of these each have like very different quality like aha's best quality is one their vocalist is absolutely freaking kills every track 
for Tears for Fears, I think it's not only their melodies and their production, but the live instruments and their arrangement. The arrangement is the best on a synth pop album. I mean, it you just have motifs that get repeated. You hear that in other songs. That some of the songs blend into each other, and like the the transitions are really good. But I think what Please does really well is that it's the sounds of the synths are so dark, so rich, and just the basses are thumping. It just sounds sounds like melted butter. It just and that's another thing that I give uh, Solid State Survivor and Pleasure Principle is that the synth just sound so damn good. One hundred percent, Garrett. Well said. If you're looking for just a couple of records that you want to listen to or check out for synth pop, I would definitely stick to the eighties records. You know, the, the pleasure principle, the aha hunting high and low tears for fears song from the big chair and uh pet shop boys with please. I think if you really just want like a quick snapshot, I would listen to those four records, but I recommend every single album here. You know, when we get into the nineties, we start to see a lot of bands exploring a darker sound, you know, a, a more sinister and an even more melodramatic sound. Goth baby. Yes. Uh, goth very much embraced the sound of synth pop. We, we got like dark wave. We got, you know, new wave, post punk. A lot of the goth movement kind of embraced the sound of synth pop music and made it a darker, more sinister branch. Even bands like new wave bands like The Cure and whatnot really started to Later on, the later they got, they started to draw more synth pop influences, putting synths more into their sound. But no one did dark, mellow synth pop better than Depeche Mode. Yes, sir. The goats of dark synth pop. Yeah, like Violator came out in 1990 at the turn of the 80s. I think this is one of the most iconic synth pop albums of all time. It is one of my favorite albums of all time. And it really shows, it really, I think, just captures the darker sound that synth pop would evolve into yeah it's the lyrics are dark they're isolated they're almost kind of obsessive and broody the drum definitely there's definitely a little cynicism yeah sprinkled on top (laughs) yeah i was going to say to say the least i mean the hooks do not stop the synthesizers are deep and they're dark they're also very punchy despite the, the darkness of it, it still has really, really nice melodies, really oh, yeah. great, really great hooks to it. I mean, a it's, personal Jesus, perfect yeah. example, clean. Yeah, yeah. It, it still retains the some of the poppiness, but yeah, it really brings it into a much more goth rock, goth rock territory kind of t- yeah. sound, yeah, for sure. This is on the darker side of synth pop, but I think this record is essential, quintessential to the genre. Absolutely check this one out. Some people that might not appreciate it, and I understand that, but this is, I think, a classic and a very, very important record in the genre. Yeah, and I mean, I would say this is also influential in a lot of the darker-sounding genres that developed in the 90s as well. Yeah, agreed 100%. You know, the 90s, we saw a lot of music that went very downtrodden, very heavy and emotional and i think trip hop yeah <laughs> violator was just another record to add to the pile of downtrodden heavy and influential records in the 1990s <laughs> not only that but gary newman and depeche mode were instrumental to developing the sounds of like the industrial oh yeah sounds of the 90s oh yeah absolutely the 90s are i think synth pop started to taper off a little bit But by the 2000s, it exploded again. You know, we got another revival of synth pop. Well, mainly in the more like the indie sphere, like the indie tronica, you know, with like Postal Service and and even Kanye West with 808s and Heartbreaks. He would fully embrace the sound of electronic music by the end of the 2000s, along with LaRue and her debut record. Some massive hits came from that album, like Bulletproof. Yeah, In For The Kill, huge synth pop hits. And, you know, we get into the 2000 with the explosion of electronic music, like dubstep, house music. And even then, synth pop was still alive and well. We got groups like, you know, Tame Impala completely doing a 180 and going fully synth pop on Currents. And I, that's actually another record I wanted to highlight here is Currents by Tame Impala. Yeah, that is, I would argue, one of the best synth pop albums of all time as well. Really? Yes. 
deterrence, I would say, is a... I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily put it above any of the albums that, that we've mentioned before. I would say that it's... It's a better pop album than Violator is. It's definitely should be in the conversation with all of these. Yeah, and that's why I've got it here. Currents was one of the biggest albums of the 2010s. Yeah, Currents has more of a live kind of drum and bass quality, a little bit more of like an R&B background. I feel like the album itself focus, focuses more on the straight-up ambient textures that you get in synth pop more and I mean, it definitely leans more into psychedelic, yeah. but like mm. you, you hear some of the synth on that album, like on Let It Happen or For the First Time, and you tell me that's not a synth pop record. Yeah. I've seen a lot of internet conjecture talking about how this album can be considered overrated sometimes. I've seen that before. But I, I agree a little bit. <laughs> but, yeah. I think it's the blend of the psychedelic sides and the bit of the ambient textures along with the R&B rhythm that was added to it, it it brought synth pop for me to a, a new height. It all really coalesced so very, very well, along with the the very high, almost ethereal melodies from the vocals. It was very, very, very well produced, very well put together album. Yeah, the only reason that I give it some criticism, and almost unfairly so, is and the reason why some people look at it in a little bit more of a negative light is because of the career change in which yeah. Kim Parker ever went. Yeah, because you got to think, he was the figurehead for psychedelic rock in the, in the early, early 2010s. 2010s. Yeah. He was the, in my opinion, was one of the best to do it. Yeah, I mean, Interspeaker, if not the best to do it. Interspeaker and Loderism, those are classic yeah. 2010s albums. Like, for him to just make such a significant stylistic change i mean i didn't really it didn't really surprise me yeah because i mean i remember when this album came out a lot of people were disappointed uh, by it where i disagree at least i think it's a little overrated i do think some of the melodies are kind of dorky like i'm not i'm not gonna lie like i think let it unless i know the better like i love that song but it it's so dorky the the subject matter the song topic itself some of the the bouncier like bass lines it's a it's a little dorky now it, it's universally relatable of course. Yes, but you could also say that about a lot of synth pop yeah. as well. They have, yeah. there's dorky melodies are kind of almost the norm. The bread and butter. <laughs> yeah. Also, sometimes I think Kevin Parker is a little one note as a vocalist, but that's for another conversation. But still, Currents, I think it's a great album. I think it's fantastic, and I think it's a modern staple in synth pop. Now, a more recent example, and an album that I actually liked a little bit more than Currents is... A Little Dark Age from MGMT. Yes, Little Dark Age by MGMT. I think this album is staple, quintessential modern synth pop. I think it's fantastic. It's very dark. Gets into a little uh, more of the darker, cynical side of synth pop with guys like Depeche Mode. Not as melodramatic, but it's still got a lot of melodrama. And it has some of the like really funny lyrics, honestly. Very, she works out too much. <laughs> it's very sarcastic. It is so cynical in its presentation. What, from what I read about the record, MGMT kind of wrote it in response to all the stuff that was happening in the mid 2010s, you know, like Trump getting elected, a lot of the tragedies that were going on at that time. It kind of inspired them to make this really cynical and dark synth pop album. And I think it's MGMT's best album to date. Yeah. I think it's better than Oracular Spectacular. That might get you some disagreement among MGMT fans, but I agree. It's it's close. Yeah, it's close. It's still a great album, but I mean, Little Dark Age, I mean, even the self-titled track, that's like one of my favorite pop songs of the past 10 years. I mean, it's dynamic. It's very dark. It's very, you know, there's clear movements and the main melody and the chorus, it, it all just gets stuck in your head. And it seems like it was recorded in such a way to make it sound older than it is. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely has a nostalgic flair to it. it sounds a little bit fuzzy. I think this is a modern staple a quintessential modern synth pop album and you should definitely listen to it you know some key tracks especially the first half you know she works out too much uh me and michael little dark age T.S. Lamp. uh when you die ts lamp all fantastic songs i think this album along with a couple of others like currents show that synth pop is alive and well and still extremely popular i mean in the 2020s you even have the weekend busting out great synth pop albums like After Hours and Dawn FM. 
honestly, I really don't see this genre going anywhere. I think this, along with rock and hip hop, they're permanent now. Can't say what the future holds, but I just don't see modern music taking any radical term from these three genres. These are the staples. Yeah, synth pop is one of the most significant pop movements in general. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. I mean, you know, there's a lot of offshoots. You could argue about the subgenres and all that good stuff, but synth pop as a blanket, as a bubble, I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. And I think it's a great genre. And that's why we think you should check these records out and give them a spin. Maybe you'll find something you like. Absolutely. It's one of the iconic standout genres of music. Love it or hate it, it cannot be ignored. But yeah, with that being said, guys, do you have any final thoughts about this synth pop guide? Anything else you want to say to the listener? Some other artists I can add to the, the pile. If you want a more of a whimsical, funny, I guess more comedic side to synth pop where he kind of has some synth pop overlap, uh, J- Jack Stauber could probably, yeah, there's a lot no, of synth pop yeah. tracks that he makes that are in that, uh, on a, in a different vein from what we talked about, a little, a different lens, so to speak. Yeah, definitely more absurdist. Yeah. But, you know, if you don't really like some of the darkness, you could, you could check out some of his stuff. Yeah. And definitely YMO, very positive group. Yeah. You know, very, I'd say. Very but bright. I recommend every single one of these records here. And I think all of these in some way, shape or form are quintessential to the genre. Believe me, coming from a person who used to listen almost exclusively to rock and, and blues, and I still listen to a lot of it now, but Synth pop is one of the genres that really helped me push out of my boundaries. And once I recognized some of the things that they were doing, some of the influences they had, I could pick out things from from R&B, from like soul and stuff that has been incorporated in this genre, especially soul. Like a lot of vocal melodies and stuff in synth pop, even in the 80s, was heavily influenced by a lot of a lot of the soul, the emotional, the the expressive and passionate sounds of that genre. So, hollow if, notes. yeah, hollow notes. So, please, please give this genre a try. It'll help you expand your horizons. With that being said, give us some feedback. You know, let us know if you want to do more of these and what genres you want to have us explore, learn about. Maybe recommend some lists to you guys. Uh, we're going to link every single album that we mentioned here in the comment or not in the comments in the description down below. So please go ahead and check that out. If you want, we can put it in a playlist for you, you know, give us some feedback, let us know what you guys think of this new approach. New metal starter pack win. <laughs> oh, uh, Lincoln parks debut. We should just Lincoln like Park sophomore. We should just bring it up Garrett and just make Mac do it. Make <laughs> Mac have to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, guys. With that being said, this is Off The Key Podcast, and you're listening to A Guide to Synth Pop, and we're out of here. Thanks, guys. Mac here, and I just wanted to give a shout out to Lacrembo for the intro and outro music. Also, check out our link tree for where to follow us. We are on Instagram and Facebook and a variety of streaming platforms. And if you could give us a sub or a listen or even a follow, it'd be greatly appreciated. Thanks, guys. See you later. <laughs>